whenever there's a change in the industry or in the business or in just like the climate, whether it be, you know, a financial uh, collapse, uh, a pandemic, and now just changes in the way agents are paid, there's always opportunity. <laughs> yeah, Rob watching the transformation, bro. Seriously. Rob, Rob took some time away from the bench press to join us today. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the opener when we go live oh, well, so we're live right now hey everyone uh, <laughs> we have rob lucido here and he took some time away from the from the squat rack and from the smith machine to uh join us today good to be here to i'm be just trying to catch up i'm just trying to catch up yeah dude come on where have you been no i don't look good too jacked so i'm trying to stay a little that's right a little smaller that's the best you're you know? trying you're trying no my wife is like i don't like when your muscles get too big i'm like all right i guess i'm not uh. oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a great it's a great Whatever one the wife wants yeah i love that all right everyone welcome we're gonna be talking about commanding higher compensation with yeah. robert lucido he's got a massive team all around the united states have you guys broken into canada yet or no we yeah, are you guys canada. are in canada right yeah, what wait are. what other countries are you in besides the u.s and canada just the us and canada okay i heard i heard somebody's telling me that you're going to england next and then oh yeah then, i heard there so. was gonna be some yeah i heard there was gonna you guys should do like some place that you know you really want to always that you really want to travel to like costa rica or something well on the mortgage side we do business in hawaii so that's an excuse to go out there so well that's still okay. america though yeah america um hey is is uh is is the big man Bob on the on the webinar listening to us today. Now I'm nervous. I don't. Oh, it looks like he is. <laughs> Bob, when are you expanding to Costa Rica? I'm happy to lead that team for you. <laughs> um, and by the way, I have my special shirt on. So if anyone is asking, yes, this is being recorded. If you have that question, just look at my shirt, and the answers um, are there for you on my chest. Um, as weird as that sounds. Um. So anyway, should we get started? Let's go. Right, yep. I'm just gonna, should I just do a quick? Oh, are we live on Facebook? Should I just do a quick intro? Yeah, man. Do it. Do right, a double. Cool. So do a, we all know that today that there is a la a large amount of uncertainty in the industry. Inventory is like way down. Transactions are low. I mean, almost every agent that I talk to is at least like twenty five to forty percent um, below what their business is is usually at. Uh, this time, you know, in, in a normal year, um, interest rates are, are high. Um, and you know, there's lots of changes happening to the commission structures and, you know, buyer agency, but there's a silver, silver lining. There's actually a huge opportunity to, um, compete and be prepared, uh, be a prepared agent as the market changes over the summer. And today we have Robert Lucido Jr. We got Tristan, we got me, and we're going to talk about commanding higher compensation. So we're going to talk about, um, you know, opportunities and where they exist. Five ways that you can differentiate yourself in the competition. Look, here's what it comes down to: whenever there's a change in the industry or in the business or in just like the climate, whether it be you know a financial uh, collapse, uh, a pandemic and now just changes in the way agents are paid, there's always opportunity, you know? And so instead of thinking about, woe is me, my business is going to go into the toilet and I'm never going to survive or succeed, look at what could possibly be. And that's what we're going to talk about. So I'll shut up now. No, I think that's spot on. I mean, Nassim Talib, who's a professor at Hopkins, wrote a bunch of books around statistics, specifically in business. And, um, he basically pioneered the concept of black swan in, in modern economics. And so you hit the nail on the head. Great recession was a black swan event. These are these events that have massive impacts on the overall economy or industry. Um, I think we're in one right now and it's a huge opportunity. 2008 was terrible for our industry. A lot of people lost a lot of money. Yeah. You can go on, you can go on Google right now and look up an article from March 2010, just two years later from Reuters, mm -hmm. showing that the number of millionaires in the world had reached a new high of 10 million and their collective net worth had gone up 17% to 39 trillion. 
That was in two years after total hit the fan. Meltdown. And so I think there's a huge opportunity, and a lot of people are kind of scared burying their head in the sand, but I think it's a big opportunity for people to make a lot of money over the next two years. I agree, man. I agree. Just showing up. Just showing up with the right energy. Yeah. So do you guys want to dive into some slides? and then yeah, let's go and take a look at some slides. What do you have for us? I'm going to take notes. All right. So this will be uh, a few excerpts from one of the trainings that we run for our organization. Uh, we call this one, it's VIP buyer. So you'll see in the bottom right there, that's what that refers to. Mm-hmm. So this is our sales systems for how we train our agents to get much higher compensation than what you're probably accustomed to uh, or, or would assume would be typical. So to start off, we'll, we'll focus on just one basic concept, which is how do you grow your business? Setting aside whatever industry, real estate, set it aside, it could be any business. There's really only three core ways that you grow your business. The first is you get more clients. The second is you get your clients to buy from you more times. And the third is you get your clients to pay you more. And in our business, virtually 90 to 95% of the focus goes to number one. It's always the new new lead, the new lead source. Get the next lead, get the new lead campaign, all top of funnel stuff. And then number two, admittedly, most agents are pretty bad at it. Roughly 90% of clients say they would work with their agent again, but only 12% do. So number one gets all the focus. Number two, we're generally pretty terrible at it. And up until this point, very few people have ever really considered number three, which is we could actually get our clients to pay us more. And whenever I run these trainings around the country, I'll pose this question to the audience and let them work through, try to find these answers. Everyone always comes up with number one. And then they'll basically come up with other ways to say number one, like referrals or running, you know, farming campaigns, all different derivatives of number one. And then I'll basically step in and help them. I'll give them a scenario. And then they come up with number two. Virtually no one comes up with number three because they always have the predisposition of real estate in the back of their mind, which is you you take what you accept or you accept what you're given. Well, also so, a lot of agents don't think they're worth it. 100%. Or they they think that if they try, they're going to lose the client. 100%. In, in the state of Florida last year, there was a study, 98% of buyer commissions were Uh, set by the seller at the same rate. And I remember asking an audience, what do you think, what does that tell you? Or how does it make you feel if virtually every seller in the state is saying you guys are all equal and all worth the same? Mm -hmm. And I remember one person raised their hand and was like, well, that's great. I think that's great. And I was like, because you're not worth more than than X percent. And so- Like if every car were the same price. Exactly. That's actually one of the analogies we'll get into here in a bit. Oh, sorry. My bad. You're just leading me on here. Actually, (laughs) I actually had no idea that was coming. (laughs) All right. So we're going to focus on number three, which is how do we get our clients to pay us more? And to lead in, we'll take a look at, I think actually you turned me on to this first book, Tristan. I think it was built to last. I think you made that recommendation. Yep. But this is a series of books from Jim Collins, which if you're looking to grow a great big business or whatever size, if you're looking to grow a great business, I would really recommend you read these books. The first book seeks to answer the question, what leads to enduringly great visionary companies? These are companies that were at the top of their industries for over a hundred years. That was a result of a six year long research project. And it ultimately led to the next book, which was they took a step back and said, well, how did these visionary companies become great in the first place? And the last book in this series is called How the Mighty Fall. And this ultimately came to the question of these questions that these companies that went from good to great and were great for more than 100 years. By the time he wrote the fourth book, several of them had failed, had gone out of business, are no longer around. So how did these companies that dominated for more than 100 years go out? Just like flipping a light switch. And he starts off with the point number one, which is a concept of what he calls hubris born of success, which is these companies have been great for so long that they do things the way that they've always been done, and they lose a sense of questioning the why behind it. 
In other words, they fall in love with the routine or the processes rather than the critical thinking behind each of those things. And then when conditions change, they fail to innovate or adjust because they're still going to do the same things over and over again. He said that about specific companies. I think it holds a lot of weight for our entire industry. If we think about what specifically buyer agents have been doing for decades, we're fundamentally going into a consultation making the same value prop. We're making the same presentation of value. We're charging the same way in the same amounts, and we're collecting that compensation the same way. And so if we're seeking to make more, we have to differentiate ourselves, but yet everyone's still playing in the confines of the same paradigm. No one's willing to go outside and say, hey, I'm going to be worth a lot more. And so up until this point, I said this in a podcast a few weeks ago, everyone is basically like, you know, I can charge this and how can I collect that? When the question we should be asking uh, ourselves is how much do we want to charge and what can we deliver that would be worth it? In other words, we start with price and then build our value around it rather than assembling our value prop and then trying to figure out what we can charge for it. So let's start off with the critical question, which is how do you differentiate yourself? And I'll pose the question here, which is, it's a scenario. You're going to be in the business of running a hot dog stand. So set real estate off to the side for a second. And you're going to get one competitive advantage and only one competitive advantage. But whatever you wish for or whatever you ask for, that's going to be the one thing that's going to set you aside. It's going to help you crush the competition. Tristan, what would you say? If I could get one thing only? One thing only for your hot dog stand. For my hot dog stand. Um, dude, that's a tough one, man. I would probably say have the tastiest hot dogs. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I'm, what I'm, do you I'm, say, Nick? I'm hungry, dude. I'm, I want the hot dogs. Um, I would say offer multiple types of relish. Okay. So the different different ways to enhance it I think so you're most closer nick <laughs> yeah you think <laughs> where we're yeah go ahead. go ahead man we're just messing a lot up. of people will say the best ingredients or the best taste or whatever but you can have the best product and terrible marketing and a terrible hot dog with really good marketing will beat you probably nine not uh, ten times yeah. the answer is really if you have one competitive advantage set everything else to a side and what would make you successful in any situation, it would be a starving crowd, which is what you said at the end there, Tristan. In other words, you can have a terrible hot dog. You can be terrible at sales, terrible marketing. But if you're set up at the football game and it's halftime and you yeah. are the only option there, you are, you are selling out. And so if we want to differentiate ourselves, the first question we have to ask is, what are our clients starving for? And how can we fill that need? And so if you guys remember a few years ago, this was from early in COVID when everyone kind of went paranoid for toilet paper. Mm. I remember going over. Yeah, I mean, I remember, just be like Tristan and not use it. I don't need toilet paper. I don't need toilet paper. You must have one of those Japanese toilets. Huh? Didn't you ever watch, you watch, you watch the South Park episode, didn't you? I and haven't, but I've, I've been to Japan when I was younger and I was like. That's I a whole experience. other webinar there, Rob. So... What could make someone all of a sudden hoard toilet paper? And, and so that's kind of like a, in a very recent uh, situation of, of how essentially being uh, starving for something can, can drive to demand. If we look at pricing of toilet paper, it went from $30 to $110 inside of 30 days. Wow. I remember going over to my friend's house for like a family dinner. And I remember opening the bathroom and it was stocked to the ceiling with toilet paper. And I looked back to the, to the father of the family. I was like, what's going on? He was all proud, like he had protected his family <laughs> from the coming crisis. But if we go back to that question, which is what are buyers starving for? The median sale price has gone from 190 in 2002 to 485,000 last year. Let's look at the last really three and a half years from 2000. It went from 320 to peaking at 485. At the same time of interest rates have went from three to peaking at 8%. What does that lead to? It means that to afford the median priced home in 2020, you need a qualifying income of 49,000. 
Now, if you look at um, the, to, in order to afford the median priced home last year, you needed a qualifying income of 105,000. And so roughly half of all buyer purchasing power has evaporated. And so that's led to a real systemic impact on what our buyer is able to afford on top of the limited inventory, on top of the limited new bills coming onto the market. With us, we've come up with basically a creative solution. So we believe that great salespeople uh, overcome objections, great entrepreneurs solve them. Mm -hmm. So whenever there's a really pressing objection, we should take a step back and say, this is a great opportunity. How do we solve that? So on our side of things, we stepped up to the plate and created a mortgage entity specifically designed to help agents help their clients better afford houses. So we operate it differently, directly to wholesale. We pass all the savings back on to the consumers. And so it's a real entity designed specifically to help um, those clients better afford houses, which allows for more value for the agent so they can make a better living. And so it's a win for everyone involved. But let's dig into the five key ways we train our people to differentiate themselves. The first one, which we just gave you example of, is offering solutions that buyers are starving for. Notably right now, it's housing affordability. Now, in the past, whenever you encounter that objection, that it would basically be, hey, let's just get you to a lender partner, see what they can do. If you don't take control over the financing or at least be involved in the financing side of the operation, you're basically you know, impeding your ability to get paid because if they can't get pre-approved to purchase the home, what's the probability of you ever getting paid? Yeah. And so this was another way that we bridged that gap. Here's just a couple few examples of what I'm talking about. So this was a rate sheet as of last week. This was uh, Moxie's rate compared to the leading competitor, which is the largest mortgage company in the country. You can see we're at basically a, a, a full point lower on these mortgage rates. And here are just some examples of the savings. And I show you this not to like brag or impress upon you, but just to show what I'm talking about, because here are two examples. Here was one, this was a few weeks ago, three weeks ago. We helped this client get their rate down from an 8.2 to a 6.998. Wow, man. Over, and over the course of 30 years, that will save them 236,000. Wow. Now, if I'm meeting with you, Nick, for a buyer consultation, and I'm going to be able to save you almost a quarter of a million dollars, would you be willing to pay me an additional five to $10,000 at closing in order to tap into those savings? And so yeah. that becomes part of the value equation to help them better afford houses, not just when they close, but also over the term of the ownership. So that's number one, is offering solutions that buyers are starving for. Number two comes down to what clients perceive as value. There's a lot of talk around creating value and it always seems to me to me to be very surface level. Mm -hmm. And so I want to give you four concrete ways that actually drives a client's perception of value. Number one is dream outcome. What does your client hope to achieve by purchasing your services? I don't know if, can you guys hear this? No, because you got to share your sound. Uh, you okay, that? no worries. It, it was basically a video. Um, it, was a, it was a commercial from 2002 from American Airlines. Mm -hmm. And it was a, basically a 30 second bit to sell their services, which their services are what? Flights. Mm -hmm. And in the video, you don't see a single inside of an aircraft. Instead, you're just seeing all these different vacation destinations. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so when we ask ourselves, what are our clients hoping to achieve by purchasing our services? We need to not only fulfill that dream outcome, but we need to sell to it. And that means selling the vacation, not the plane flight. Yeah. Virtually every buyer agent goes into a consultation and says, I'll, do, I'll deliver A, B, C, D services to you. Buyers don't really care about the services. They care about the outcome. And so we need to sell the outcome as opposed to just a conglomerate of services. And so here's just a few examples of what that dream outcome fundamentally in includes. And then each buyer will have things on top of it. 
but it's a great, it's buying a dream home at a great price with a great interest rate on a convenient time frame and mitigating the risk thereafter. That's the dream outcome, number one. Number two is the perceived likelihood of success. How likely are they to achieve it? Because they can hire me, for example, and I can deliver that dream outcome with a 2% success rate, or they could hire Nick and get a 95% success rate. That changes the perception of value. Here's just an example to illustrate that. You could go play Mega Millions and you could win 650 million, but you have a one in 302 million chance of winning. Or you could pay, take that dollar and play roulette and you're going to have a 47% chance of winning. But if you win, you're only going to win a dollar. So there's different considerations. It's not just dream outcome, but it's also the perception of how likely they are to succeed. And so here's a couple, just a few examples of how we help increase the perceived likelihood of success. So like with Moxie, for example, we go down to a 500 credit score. So we routinely work with people that have been a, a turned down by virtually every other lender because most lenders cannot go below 640. And then we get the lower interest rates for every um, adjustment of, of, of um, interest rate. We basically can help them go up a million, a thousand dollars in the offer. So it makes them better able to compete and win that house by getting the interest rate lower and keeping their monthly payment the same. So that's just two examples there. Now, number three and number four are time decay and effort and sacrifice. And so these are the four aspects to how we go about creating value in the mind of our consumers, two of which we want to maximize and two of which we want to minimize. So starting with number three, which is time decay. I'll give you an example. You guys recognize this? What is it, a stove? Mm. Now, Wait, what, guys, is, what is it, like a Sears catalog? Oh, there you yeah, go. Nailed it. Yeah, so Sears catalog. Sears, the catalog actually sold 40,000 homes through the catalog. Oh, yeah, the Sears house. There's actually one of those um, in my neighborhood, actually. Really? Yeah. So Sears catalog was at the top of the game. They dominated the industry for over 100 years. And they're not around anymore. And so... Why is that? Who put them out of business? Obviously, the advent of the internet did. Specifically, Amazon really put the nail in the coffin. And so what did Amazon do that Sears didn't do? Or rather, what did Amazon do that was better? And so Sears had the dream outcome. You could open up the catalog and you could find virtually any product you can imagine in there. You could pick up the phone and you could order it. And you'd basically have a very high chance of actually getting the thing the only downside would be if they were sold out. But you had to pick up the phone, you had to wait on hold, you had to place the order, and then you had to wait a few weeks for the item to arrive. Amazon basically said, we're going to do number one and number two even better. But where we're really going to differentiate ourselves is by allowing you to sit on your couch, pull out your phone and click one button, and then it will say, do you want your delivery today or tomorrow? So they minimize the time delay and minimize the effort and sacrifice. And if number three and number four are, are zero, your value is infinite because that means whatever they're looking to buy, they will get it right away with no effort, no sacrifice. So number three is how long will it take to achieve it? And I'll give you two little tips from what we incorporate into our VIP program. The first is um, they both fall under the category of quick wins. So the majority of your buyer's or your client's perception of your client experience is actually shaped within the first 48 hours. So if you're looking to get a five-star review, you're, you're looking to anchor that perception within that first 48 hours. So as soon as they sign those docs, you have a 48-hour shot clock. And so what we seek them to do, we actually have them sign to it in our buyer agency agreements. They will get pre-approved within 72 hours and they will start seeing homes shortly thereafter. So we aim to show them nine homes in nine days, of which a portion of them are off market. Because if you're only showing them properties that are on the MLS, newsflash, they already have access to all of them. So what value are really providing? So 
One other aspect to that is certainty and clarity. So the London subway system was basically struggling. They were getting inundated by uh, bad rider reviews. And so they commissioned a panel to try to figure out how they could improve rider satisfaction. And the commission came up with two proposals. One was to shut down the subway and spend billions of dollars to rebuild it for faster routes with faster trains. The second option was to install these dotted maps in the subway that just let riders know where the trains were and how long they expected to wait. They went with number two. It cost them a couple million dollars and the rider, sat rider satisfaction reached the best levels ever. So as it turns out, people didn't care as much of how long they needed to wait. They just wanted to know how long they needed to wait and they wanted it to be accurate. And so what we train our people to do is always set um, expectations around time of which they'll be delivered, but always set them so that you're going to exceed them. I'll give you an example. We've all been late to things like go, meeting up with friends. And so you're running late and you call your friend, you know, you're going to be 30 minutes late and you tell them what be there at 15. And then you show up 40 minutes later. And so now you're not just late, but you're later than you even told them they would be. And so now you made it even worse yourself. You'd be better off just saying, hey, I'll be there in an hour. And then you get them there 40 minutes later. And now it's like, hey, you're early. Great. So always set clear expectations and always exceed them. Number four is effort and sacrifice. How much input will it require to achieve it? As a part of our VIP buyer system, our agents are not just presenting value in terms of real estate services, but also renovation, title, financing, moving, and the list goes on. So our agents basically become a one-stop shop for not only all of these services, but great deals across all of them. So that is creating value across all dimensions. And then we'll power through the last three here quickly. This is my favorite one. Pricing to position effectively. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm going to give you two scenarios. First one is you're selling an item on eBay. And eBay says you got three call structures. Nick, which one are you choosing? One, two, or three? It's a $10 item. Um, no what wrong. do you mean I get this? Oh, I'm working for eBay? You're selling an item on eBay. Oh, I'm selling an item on eBay. Um, let's see. 15 cents flat fee plus 3%. 15 I mean, I would probably, probably number one. How about you, Tristan? Dude, I'm probably going to go for three. Let's go for three. Okay. So the majority of people pick number two. I'll give you one more scenario. Really? That's interesting. $200 item. You got a three options, a $3 flat fee and three and a half percent of oh, sales, 5% of sales or a $10 flat fee, $200 item. Which one are you picking? Oh, I didn't notice the amount, the amount of the, the, I'm item. Gonna, what do you pay? I'm picking the same one too. Okay. I'm going to pick. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to pick two also. So majority of people will pick one in the second scenario, but I told you it doesn't matter. There's no wrong answer because they're all the same. Oh, wow. Interesting. But this just shows you that pricing in and of itself shapes how people perceive value and their buying decisions. How you charge is more important than how much you charge. Mm. And yet when agents in virtually so many different industries you make your presentation of value and then you tell them the price at the very end. We kind of perceive that price is distinct from the value. It's what they have to pay for the value. But instead, price is a, a measure of that value. And in other words, um, Nick, what's your favorite hobby? Uh, what's my favorite hobby? Oh my God, I don't even Working have out. hobbies. Fortnite it's not really a hobby. Oh, playing Fortnite. What is it? Playing Fortnite. Fortnite. All right. So That's right, baby. That's I don't know right. too much about Fortnite, but ah, oh, well. So I would ask you a question. That. Come on, ask Robert. You, you gotta change that, Rob. Come on. Between work and the squat rack, You're I don't know. I mean, you know. 
So Nick, I would ask you a question. Would you be willing to buy Fortnite? The answer obviously would be yes, right? Sure. Now, would you be willing to buy Fortnite for $25,000? Yeah. How about 50 or 100,000? At some point, there's going to be a price tag that's not worth your perception of value. Right, exactly. And so just asking someone if, they're, if they would be willing to buy something is meaningless. And so when we make our presentation, we're going to present our core offer and then tell them what it's worth. And then that and then whatever that price tag is, they'll calibrate whether they think it's on target, above, or below. And mm -hmm. then we can work on overcoming those objections early on in the process, as opposed to leaving it towards the very end. And I'll show you how in the next in the next part. But because of that, the fact that we understand now that pricing impacts how we perceive value. I suggest this to the room that raising your prices can actually enhance the value you provide, which kind of sounds a little crazy to, to many people, but I'll show you. There's a study that gave survey participants three bottles of wine mm -hmm. saying low priced, medium priced, and high priced wine, except it was the same bottle of cheap wine in all three. <laughs> and yet survey participants in a blind test ranked them in exact order of the price tag on the bottle. Another study took it to a next level and gave them five bottles. Instead of low, medium, high, it gave them real price tags. And then it took it to even further and put them in an MRI. And so when they were tasting the wine that had higher price tags, they would see two parts of the brain light up even more. And these parts of the brain are involved with evaluating expectations and seeking rewards. Hmm. In conclusion, when we see a higher price, our brain links the price to greater expectation of war uh, of reward and uh, greater perception of value. So we need to throw away our notions about what's fair. And we basically have a pricing credo. So you can adopt this as you deem fit. You should charge as much as you can for your services. But you should never charge more than they're worth but you should charge a lot more than they cost. Mm. Tristan, how much is your monthly phone bill? 600. 600? Yep. How many lines do you have? Five. Okay. Do you know how much it costs them to support your lines per month? No, how much? Probably like, a, probably like five cents. About 10 cents. That's amazing. So the value, the price tag for their services is totally disconnected to the cost to provide them. It's instead in line with the value that Tristan perceives, perceives from them. And the same thing needs to happen from our buyers. We need to show them so much value that they're willing to pay a higher price tag mm -hmm. because it's not connected to the cost of the actual services. Uh, here's, another, here's another example, Chanel. Chanel. Chanel's value as a brand is inherently tied to the price tag. The price tag makes it exclusive, which therefore drives the demand for it. Their price tags are not connected to the cost of the leather. Their leather is not 70 times more expensive or whatever it is than, you know, coach or whatever other manufacturers. Mm -hmm. They do, I found these incredibly impressive, but they actually, in, they actually limit the number of um, items per SKU per each store. So they will only send two items of each bag to an individual store so that every item in the store is leader, is either sold out second to last or the last item in stock. And so what does that do to a buyer's perce perception of value if they walk in and every item is either sold out or almost sold out? It creates urgency. In 2021, they took it to a next level and they actually limited overall purchases to two per year per individual. Wow. And so their whole go-to-market strategy is centered around the price tag. And so for someone to suggest pricing cannot increase the perception of value is obviously in disagreement with arguably the most successful manufacturer of, of handbags. A good deal is when your clients believe what they are getting is worth more than what they are giving. It's not necessarily getting the lowest price tag. It means getting more than they think they're paying for, which is how people are willing to pay $10,000 for a bag that they could buy for 
couple hundred dollars if the brand was just replaced on it. All right, number four was stacking value through the offer presentation. And so this is what I was hinting at before, which is you show your pricing earlier in the process to allow people to calibrate whether they think it's valuable or not. A single offer is less valuable than the same offer broken into its component part and stacked as bonuses. So what this really means is, but wait, there's more. It's like every infomercial in the world. They know exactly what they're selling and their target price tag on it. But instead of saying, hey, if you call now, we'll give you two sets of Martha Stewart cookware and shipping for $39.99, they're going to shift it. And they're going to say, hey, here's a set of Martha Stewart cookware for $39.99. But wait, there's more. If you call now, we'll give you a second set for free. But wait, there's more. We'll send it to you at no cost for shipping. So how we present our buyer presentations breaks it down into four different sections. So that when we give our core offer and present our pricing, we still have multiple other bonuses that we're stacking on top. Number five, and this is the last part, is just mitigating risk. So risk is the single greatest objection to getting a deal done. So how do you mitigate that risk for the client? Reverse the risk to get them to engage with your services. Our value prop is not centered around services like majority of agents. Ours is centered around guarantees of outcome. What we talked about before, selling the vacation. The strength of the guarantee will two to four X your conversion rate. Because buyers don't buy products. They buy the benefits that these products offer to them. So in summation, here are the five uh, ways our VIP buyer program differentiates you, but obviously you can do that outside of our specific approach. And I'll leave you with this final thought here. The greatest commodity in the world is water. Water out of a water fountain is free. In a bottle, it's $2. If you put bubbles in it, it's $3.50. <laughs> and if you put it in a mini fridge, a Las Vegas hotel, it's $15. It's the same damn water. And it's, uh, the largest commodity in the world. And yet for something that's so ava widely available, they're even, even able to differentiate that product. And so if they can do it with water, there's no excuse why you can't do it for your services. The question becomes how? And if you want some help, go ahead and scan the QR code and you can download um, a condensed version of today's slides that will focus it basically be a guide for helping you to construct your own VIP buyer program to help deliver on those five things to differentiate yourself and secure higher compensation. Nice. This is good, dude. Hey, um, if anybody also wants to listen to Robert on uh, a really great podcast, they can check out the millionaire real estate agent podcast you can find it in, uh, you know, wherever you, I'm just trying to email this to myself, this barcode thing, wherever you listen to your podcasts, it's recent, like a month ago, maybe a little less. Um, you talk a lot about this on there too, right? And then a yeah, little absolutely. more like backstory about yourself and stuff, but yeah, the millionaire real estate agent podcast is a really good one. Um, this is great. So like, you know, um, if they have any questions about Moxie, where should they go check? Is that what it's called? Moxie? Yeah, Moxie Mortgage. Let me put it in the chat box. Is it MoxieMortgage.com? Yeah, you got it. Okay, so MoxieMortgage.com, but drop it in there just in case. So M-O-X-I-E Mortgage.com. What would you like, before we wrap up, Um, you know, how would an agent go about, I think creating a value proposition for many agents is very difficult, you know, because they're just kind of doing like a boiler boilerplate thing. Like what should they be doing or what, what should they be analyzing to create some value that's not normally seen? You know what I'm saying? So obviously it'll be somewhat constrained by their ability to deliver on it. So right, in other words, right. the teams that partner with us, we provide them with so many different services that it really opens up possibilities. So the first thing I would boil down or write down is all the things that they're in a position to deliver. And then they should rank them based upon essentially the cost to them to provide them and okay. the value to the client. So you want to have a low cost to you and a high value to the client. And so the services that have that um, 
uh, separation between the cost and the value should be yeah. ones that you lead with and really emphasize. And then you can stack on top of it. No, that's a good piece of advice. That's kind of like how you mentioned, you know, it only costs 10 cents for Tristan's cell phone carrier to deliver his service. Meanwhile, they're charging $600 a month. It's at low cost. You know, obviously Tristan's paying 600 because he sees value from it or has no choice. I don't know. It's either one or the other. But um, uh, I know that I really don't have a choice. But uh, yeah, I think that's that's good. Like figure out what you can offer and figure out how much it costs. Because now as buyer representatives, if there's going to be instances where the buyer is going to have to pay you, I mean, now you got to bring something to the table. Before it was just showing the houses. I mean, more than that, but they weren't compensating you. So there wasn't really much in the way of actual value out of the, out of the ordinary that you had to provide. Yeah, so, Moxie also has a full system to help agents finance closing costs into the deal. So, okay. So you hit the nail on the head. So now, so agents in the past on the buy side have largely been service-based. And on the yeah. list side, it was skill-based. Now both of them are skill-based. So if you want to be a successful buyer agent now, you have to be a successful negotiator. And so in the process of negotiating your compensation, you need to have a vehicle to make sure you can collect it. And so mm. the first is you're going to get it from the seller, but if they don't all agree to it, then you have other options. What are those options? One of them is to get a lender that knows how to finance it into the deal, which Moxie has built out a whole system to help agents do that. Cool, man. I dig it. Um, sweet. Any any final thoughts? I feel like that was a good final thought with like how agents can build their value proposition. I can finish with one thing. This um, Better be wise. Better be wise, Robert. All right. I better deliver then. <laughs> um, a distant relative of ours, of ours is a guy named A.P. Janini, which... Um, back in the early 1900s out in San Francisco, he started a bank and he, it was called bank of Italy. Okay. And in 1906, there was a massive earthquake that just shattered San Francisco. And yeah. he lived about 15 miles outside of San Francisco. And so he ran into town just to see if his bank was still there. And when he got there, there was looting all around. Now, San Francisco then is a bit different than it is today. Mm -hmm. And so their mayor actually put a shoot on site order for people that were looting. Oh my God. And so he ran into his bank and took all the cash in the reserves and put it into barrels and snuck it out, got it okay. outside the city. And the next day, all the big banks and all the players got together and had like a round table meeting and they all wanted to close their doors for six months, have a ban on lending for six months to allow the big banks and everyone to get back on their feet. Mm -hmm. AP said, screw this. He went down to the local port set up two barrels and put a two by four across of it and started lending out to the average citizen in small dollar amounts. And he did that, became a hero, the people helping them, you know, open up their business, keep their business open, yeah. providing to the average citizen. And Bank of Italy became Bank of America and became the most oh. powerful bank in the next 30 years. And he is basically credited for creating a lot of modern banking practices. And so while everyone else right now is going to try to say, hey, Let's have us freeze on everything and preserve the status quo and let everyone else recalibrate. What are you going to do to go out there and help the average citizen who needs to get that home and needs to better afford it? And if yeah. you can do that, I think you can be very successful. I hope that was wise enough. That was that. very, that's a great story. <laughs> I love it. Well, thanks, Rob. We appreciate you. Awesome. Um, if you jumped on late to this and you missed it, it's going to be on the lab code agents, YouTube channel. So make sure you go ahead and subscribe to that channel, hit the notification bell. So you know, when the videos are uploaded and scan the, can you go back to that QR code real quick that you had up? Yeah, absolutely. Cause if you want some of the slides, just scan this QR code, enter your email and your name and, uh, they'll email it over to you. Cause it's some good stuff. I appreciate that, man. Have a great day. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. See you. Right, see you guys. Have a great day, everybody.